Hi, everybody. So thank you for coming today to join this session at the uh, Open Source Summit. Today we talk about uh, maintainable and scalable kernel qualification approach for automotive. Uh, I am Gabriele Poloni. I am an open source technical leader uh, at Red Hat. And uh, today I will uh, uh, co-host this session with uh, Daniel Bristow. He is also working at Red Hat and uh, is a principal engineer working as Linux kernel maintainer. Okay, so what we're going to present today, it is a session that was uh, already presented uh, in the uh, last uh, ELISA workshop. And we would like you know, to repropose it again to, to have uh, feedbacks and uh, to raise uh, discussion. Everything that we'll present today is uh, still a work in progress. And uh, no results are binding on behalf of ELISA and Linux Foundation. And nor we make any safety claims based on this preliminary report. Okay, so what you're saying is this is that this is uh, an investigation work, an investigation activity, and uh, you know there are no claims that will be made. The agenda. Okay, so first of all, we'll clarify what is in scope and out of scope of this presentation. We'll talk about possible functional safety qualification approaches for Linux. And then we will introduce the hybrid qualification approach that is the key topic of this presentation. We will present an example of this uh, hybrid approach that we, uh, that we investigated uh, within the ELISA working groups. And then we will talk specifically about the runtime verification monitors. That is the technical activity that Daniel has been working on in the last uh, few months. Okay. And then we'll, uh, we'll uh, talk about the next steps. And uh, indeed, we'll have uh, the question and answer uh, session. Okay. So let's move on. So what is in scope? Uh, proposal and high level description of a functional safety qualification flow of kernel code allocated uh, with safety requirement to meet a certain ASIL. This is according to the ISO 26262 safety standard for automotive indeed. What is out of scope? We will not talk about the functional safety qualification of the hardware. We will not talk about any safety standard that is beyond ISO 26262. And we will not talk about freedom from interference claim between coexisting kernel drivers or subsystems that are allocated with different easy levels. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the possible approach that today are defined in the ISO 26262, okay? So if you look at this safety standard, and if we consider pre-existing software component, we have part 8.12 that talks specifically about qualification of pre-existing software component. This is a black box approach, okay? And uh, it is based on the verification of the top level requirements that are allocated to this uh, software component. Okay, so basically we have uh, a software component allocated with functional safety and uh, functional requirements. And we need to have a set of test campaign that is comprehensive enough to verify these requirements, okay. This is an approach that is commonly accepted for simple software components um, like uh, you know, uh, libraries, but indeed this is not a valid approach for uh, the Linux kernel itself that is way too complex. Okay. Then we have the part six. Part six approach is a, a white box approach. 
So you have uh, a complex software component. You need to define uh, all the software architecture, the different units, the interaction between the units, and accordingly, you will have unit tests, integration tests. So it's a very structured approach. And uh, this is indeed what is recognized to be suitable, you know, to also to assess complex software components, okay? Then we have part 8.14, and this is the proven in use, okay? Proven in use, the, it, that, that is a valid approach. However, we need to make sure, we need to have statistical data that is showing a target failure rate, okay? According to the ASIL that, uh, that we want to, 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 to target. And if we want to claim proven in use, on top of the valid the statistical data, we need also to make sure that the boundary conditions of the software element are maintained. Okay, so hypothetically, if we had the statistical data, we should make sure that the hardware is unchanged, the hardware configuration is unchanged, the software configuration is unchanged. Okay. And for a component complex like the kernel, this is, uh, you know, it's quite uh, difficult, you know, to, to, to meet, okay? And then we have finally, this part 10.9, that is the safety element out of context, uh, that is just uh, describing a way to uh, formally define a requirement. However, it doesn't tell how to practically qualify the element according to these requirements. And what it does, it redirects to the other routes that we just talked about to, in order to, to, to qualify uh, this, this element, okay? This software element, okay? Now, so today we will focus on part 8.12 and part 6 uh specifically okay now let's look at part 8.12 uh, so this 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 approach as we say it is a black box approach okay as you can see the number of artifacts of collaterals that we need to maintain is pretty simple because we just have the pre-existing software element we need to have uh, the requirements, top level requirements that must be pretty well specified, and we need to have a comprehensive test campaign to verify these requirements. Okay. And then if we have uh, all of this, you know, uh, the, the qualification is, uh, is uh, kind of complete. Okay. So uh, the amount of collaterals is not too, too big. Okay. On the flip side, if we look at the part six standard approach, we can see that the number of boxes here is much, you know, it's, it's, it's much bigger. So we see that this is a white box approach. It is much more structured, it starts from the technical safety concept. Then we have safety and nominal requirement, architectural design, unit design, implementation, unit test, integration test, platform test, validation test. So there is the amount of activities and associated artifacts and documentation to be produced is much, much bigger. And the key point here is that if we talk, when we talk about unit design, usually in functional safety, we talk about design of the single functions in the code okay and these especially all the activities that go from the unit from the unit design and, and below these these are the ones that are more um expensive you know in terms of uh, amount of collaterals to maintain okay and so Today, so what can we do in Linux, right? So Linux 
we say it, it's, it's too complex, right? To be qualified according to part 8.12, okay? We say that the safety element out of context approach that is part 10.9 only covers the requirement definition, so it doesn't provide a practical solution. We could try to assess Linux according to part six. However, if we do that, it's, we'll see that the, the effort associated with the generation of artifacts and collateral just explodes, okay? And indeed, as we, it is feasible, I mean, it is doable to use part 8.14 assuming that statistical data is valid and that the hardware software configuration and the stimulus are unchanged okay so and this is uh, you know a very very uh, big constraint right so uh, in practice it's very difficult to to use part 8.14 okay and uh, so why uh, what are the pain points of iso part six okay as we introduced previously we said that the the most of the problems are related with the unit design and the code implementation and in fact if we first let's look at the unit design okay so for each unit so for each function basically we need to have an informal notation uh, up to ASLB. And for ACLC and beyond, we need a semi formal or formal notation. Okay. And when it comes to the implementation, we, have, we need to have one entry exit point in each function, no dynamic object variables, no multiple use of variable names, no implicit type conversion. So this is. Uh, a bit hard to to be met right and when it comes to unit test verification we also need 100 percent code coverage and requirements coverage of the software units okay of the single function and we know that so today in linux we have uh, more than 80 thousands of function and more than 50 million lines of code so the effort you know to write and maintain uh, all these artifacts and collaterals Practically, this is not viable. Okay. So, what do we do? Linux is too complex for part 8.12, and part 6 is too complex for Linux, right? And uh, so, we come up uh, with an idea, okay, this hybrid approach. And here is uh, divide and conquer. So, what does it mean, divide and conquer? Let's see. Okay, we know that today Linux, okay, is uh, already partitioned into subsystems and drivers. Okay, Let's, if we just look at the maintainers file. Okay, so the idea here is, okay, instead of considering uh, a software unit like a, a function, let's consider a software unit like uh, a block of code right that could be for instance a single driver or a single subsystem to start with okay now if we take the single driver the single subsystem so the single software unit we can try to qualify this subsystem driver according to part 8.12 okay and when it comes to the interactions between the different subsystems, between the different drivers, and when it comes to the architectural verification, so the integration test, okay, we will uh, consider the integration of these uh, software units, software block subsystems working together. Okay, so practically speaking, okay, let's go back to the diagrams. Okay, so this diagram, it reminds of the one that was shown for part six. However, you can see that there is a key difference here. 
So the difference is that part six is followed from the technical safety concept down to the software architecture defined, and then from the integration testing up to the validation test. For the single block, okay, we will use part 8.12. So here, for instead of having a software function as a software unit, we have the, the drivers, the subsystems, right? So a, higher, a bigger granularity, you know, uh, pieces of code, okay? And why, so now the key question is, this approach may sounds like a sort of a shortcut, right, compared to part six. So why, why is this valid from a safety point of view? Okay. Okay, so from a safety point of view, we know that part 8.12 is already used to qualify pre-existing software components of limited complexity. And indeed, we could consider our uh, driver subsystem like a pre-existing software component of limited complexity, right? And, and according uh, to the ISO 26262, today, any pre-existing software component that is qualified according to part 8.12 can be used to be integrated into a more complex software framework, as long as the assumed safety requirement and the condition of use allocated to the pre-existing software block are, are met, okay, are defined and met. Okay, so, from a safety point of view, we can envision Linux as the integration of multiple pre-existing software components, okay, all working together, okay. And now here, the key point here is, there are two key points. One is how can we decide if a single, subsystem driver is uh, simple enough and uh, and how can we describe the, the interaction between uh, the different uh, subsystems and we will answer this in the following slide okay so so this is showing uh, in terms of uh, state diagram the different steps uh, associated to the to the hybrid approach, okay? So the first step is uh, to define and allocate assumed safety requirement for a critical uh, unit, okay? Then we, the specification of the, of the software unit are uh, written uh, following the kernel doc headers. When it comes to the interaction between the, the software unit and the other, uh, the rest of Linux, so, so and the, the other units will use the semi-formal or formal specification, okay? According to the unit specification and to the specification of the architecture of the software unit in, interacting with the others, we will uh, write the safety analysis. And then based on safety analysis, we'll, uh, we'll write kernel self-test, based uh, on the on the kernel doc header and also kernel self test based on the architectural behavior of integrating the target software unit with the with the others okay and then what we do in order uh, to verify the dynamic uh, architecture of the single software unit in interacting with the others we will use the runtime uh, verification framework that will be discussed later on okay so and indeed we have continuous integration to to the monitor uh, the, the the changes okay so now uh as we discussed today as we discussed so the the, the 
the one of the dilemma is how to decide if a unit is simple enough okay so how can i decide if a driver subsystem is simple enough to be described exclusively by uh, kernel doc headers okay and uh, part a, if we look at part a.12 okay it requires uh, to describe known safety requirements functional requirements behavior in case of failures resource usage description of required and provided interface interfaces and shared resources and also the configuration description okay so practically speaking if you're able to specify comprehensively in natural language all of the specs above the level of granularity for a single unit is the right one okay so if you're not able to comprehensively specify to, to comprehensively provide all this information for a single unit then there is something wrong okay so it means that the unit is too complex okay we cannot use kernel talk either to describe the architecture behavior it must be broken down in simpler units okay as we said linux is already partitioned so i talked already about subsystems and drivers subsystems drivers are already specified in the maintainers file okay and uh, it is a good starting point it is a starting point okay i'm not saying we maintainers is, is good enough however you know using maintainer it is easy to map the code to the people responsible for the code and <clears throat> indeed if we realize that a driver or subsystem is too complex there is nothing preventing a further division right so we will probably create another file with uh, you know with a different uh, uh, partitioning okay but by the way maintainers is a starting point okay and now let's look uh, let's look to a specific example okay so in the past uh, few months now so we have looked uh, to a specific use case that is called the telltale use case okay in the telltale use case we rely on the uh, expiration of an external watchdog as one of the key safety mechanisms okay that can trigger the system into safe state okay so to summarize what happens is that there is a, a display system that display a telltale in case of uh, uh, car failure okay and there is a safety application that is uh, receiving a message from an external monitor and if the message says hey the telltale is wrong or if the message is delayed or if the message is corrupted the safety application will stop petting an external watchdog okay and if we stop petting the watchdog the safe state is automatically triggered okay so one of the critical safety requirements is to make sure that the watchdog timeout is uh, properly set. Okay. And, uh, and therefore, this is the safety requirement that we'll uh, uh, take here as an example. Okay. So the safety requirement is the watchdog subsystem shall ensure the watchdog timeout to be set according to the IOCTAL input parameter. Okay. And, uh, and we have on the right, we have the, the entry points associated to these uh, safety requirements. Okay. And uh, one of the key entry points is the syscall define for the IOCTAL syscall. Okay. So this is uh, the kernel entry point to, to program the the watchdog uh, timeout okay using an IOC. now let's look at maintainers okay so the first uh, uh, subsystem that we the, the the subsystem that we are going to analyze here is the virtual file system okay because the ioctl is part of vfs okay and you, we can see that maintainers 
here is defining the scope for this subsystem, right? You can see like a list of uh, a directory, FS, and then a list of files, okay, that are part <coughs> of this uh, subsystem, okay? Now, what happens here? What we're showing is, okay, so we have uh, a clear scoping for our target subsystem. So our software unit is VFS, okay? In the context of the IOCTL, what are the other uh, subsystems and blocks that this software unit is communicating with, okay? And you can see, this is a, a communication diagram, effectively. We have uh, the incoming function that is the IOCTL from the safety app. And then we have uh, different uh, outgoing function, okay? And we, we can see that we have like the work queue subsystem, the security subsystem. We have the architecture specific subsystem that in our example is x86. And then we have uh, the function pointer associated to the unlocked IOCTL that is, in this case, the watchdog device trial. Okay, so you, this is basically a static view of the architecture of the different blocks interacting with the target one, that is the VFS, okay? So, and this is effectively a semi-formal notation, so it's a UML communication diagram. On top of that, we also create a dynamic view. You can see that the, sus the subsystems here are the boxes on the top, and we have uh, a sequence of events that is uh, showing the what can happen, you know, in terms of uh, flow diagram. Okay, the the flow of event uh, that is uh, uh, supporting the IOCTL uh, syscall. Okay, so following an IOCTL, what is the sequence of events between the different subsystems? Okay, so, and, and this is, so the, the communication diagram together with the flow diagram, this is uh, what constitute our uh, architectural description of the different blocks talking with each other, okay. Now, if we go to the block specification, you can see that here we proposed, okay, so this was not pushed upstream, so this is just, uh, an internal discussion, but this will be a sort of proposal for improved kernel doc header for the uh, IOCTL, okay? And, uh, and, and you can see here that we have uh, a quite uh, descriptive uh, uh, specification of the uh, possible behavior, okay? And, uh, and, and in the end, we also have uh, uh, the possible return values, okay? And there is also a to-do, so, and this is important because if there is something that is not covered yet by this kernel doc header, this should be explicitly uh, mentioned, right? So this is very important for, for functional safety, okay? Okay, so this is our uh, uh, architecture. So our specification are the software architecture plus, plus the block unit plus the block specification. Okay. Then, based on this specification, <coughs> we do a safety analysis, um, a safety analysis in the context of the uh, IOCTL to see what are the possible uh, failure modes and uh, to either, uh, you know, uh, derive uh, additional requirement or uh, refine uh, the, the architecture, okay? And, uh, and after the safety analysis where well, we have the, the code, okay? This is the, the standard code. And then we have the, the block testing, okay? So here, the kernel doc header will be used to define kernel self-test according to the specification of the kernel doc headers themselves, okay? <clears throat> when it comes to the integration testing between the different modules, we will use runtime verification monitors that can formally verify 
the behavior of the uh, runtime element to be the same as uh, specified but in the model okay <coughs> excuse me and daniel will talk about this uh, in a bit and uh, okay so now i will uh, leave the scene to, to daniel so daniel please uh, go ahead and uh, talk about uh, runtime verification so hi i'm daniel and uh, i'm more on the technical side of this presentation and i'll talk about how to integrate this idea of using runtime verification to connect the specification and uh, the, the system right so runtime verification is a lightweight but yet rigorous uh formal method and it's used to complement other other kinds of formal methods like model checking and theorem proving and uh, the difference is that instead of trying to compose a theoretical uh, view of the system, the runtime verification uh, actually works analyzing the system running live, right? Uh, try, trying to verify the, 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 the actual execution of the system. So uh, to better understand runtime verification, we need to see the two inputs from it. So in one side, we have the formal realm where we have a formal specification of the system, of the uh, desired behavior of the system. And on the other side, we have the Linux realm where we have a set of events generated by the system as it runs. So the runtime verification stands right in the middle of these two things. So it reads the trace, in one side and the other side, it reads the specification and try to combine both of them. So as the system is running and everything is fine, the, the runtime monitor should just say, okay, I think things are running as expected. Uh, but also a, a exception is handled or an event is generated that the formal specification doesn't recognize, we can take some reactions to this kind of events. And this kind of reactions can be uh, either going to a fail safe mode or uh, using these as information to, to improve our understanding of the system, right? So how, how, how can we uh, connect or how do we see uh, the, the runtime verification inside this uh, hybrid approach? Uh, uh, a huge part part of the, the specification work is actually understanding the system and specifying it in a format that can be uh, then translated to the requirements, right? And uh, one of the challenges of writing the, the, the specification of the system is actually being sure that the uh, specification matches with the actual implementation of the system. And that is even uh, more complex on a, a software that is constantly changing, like Linux. Linux is changing every day. So how can I uh, have a confidence that my uh, documentation is still matching the, the system, right? And uh, the good thing about uh, runtime verification is that with the correct uh, format of the documentation, we can uh, run the documentation in kernel or run the documentation uh, in the formal format uh, as the system runs. And we can actually compare in runtime if the documentation is still matching to the kernel. And this uh, closes the loop between the documentation and the implementation. And uh, it, uh, the idea here is to use it in, in two phases or we can use it into two phases. In one phase is at, at uh, the design time, where you can use the runtime verification to optimize the doc documentation. So let's say you start making the, the documentation of the system and explaining it, and then you use the runtime verification to see if you covered all the aspects of the system by exercising the system, reading the trace, and seeing if the documentation is, is stable, right? If it is uh, still working as the system runs. Uh, it will reach a time in, in which uh, 
the specification starts combining with the, the kernel, and we can say that uh, we try to cover it, right? Uh, after that, after we are uh, we reach a level of uh, of knowledge of the specification good enough, we can also use the specification in the runtime monitoring of the system. Uh, so one thing that we 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 think when using formal methods is okay. Formal methods are complex. How can I um, specify the system using uh, a formal language, right? It is not always that easy. The good thing is that in the hybrid approach, uh, Gibro is, is finding the UML uh, sequence diagram as a, a useful uh, language to express the, the runtime behavior of the system. And uh, this, this informal language can be easily converted into a formal uh, language, which is automata. Uh, but why automata? Uh, the good thing is that previously to this work, I was already using automata to describe the behavior of the part of Linux. And this part of Linux was the synchronization model of the parameter T. And uh, using automata, I was able to create a description of the, the thread synchronization. And uh, I was um, successfully on, on explaining it, uh, even though the system was uh, really complex. So the thread synchronization model has more than 9,000 states and 21,000 transitions. So Automata was flexible. I could explain this uh, very complex uh, system building up uh, the, this complex model from a, a set of small specifications, like with less than 10 states. So it is, it is practical on, on using on Linux. Moreover, on my research, I also found a way to, to get the, the formal specification using automata and converting it into kernel code and run the documentation or the formal specification in parallel with the kernel at runtime, synchronously, at a very low overhead. Indeed, the overhead of uh, uh, running the automata was lower than actually saving this trace for for uh, for post processing on a later time. So this gives us a, a, a good evidence that this can scale for the purpose of the hybrid approach. Uh, okay, that part was the research part. The good thing is that I've been working on transforming the research into uh, actually kernel code, and here you can see that I already submitted. Uh, the first version of the runtime verification interface for the Linux kernel. And it's basically composed of two things. One, one tool that automatically generates uh, the runtime monitor code based on the specification and an intuitive interface where we can control the monitors available in the system, enabling and disabling them and configuring them to have different kinds of reactions. So, Let's say that we have a sequence diagram, we converted it into the automata format, which should be straightforward. Here I am showing how can we translate the automata here in the uh, WIP dot dot file. This is the automata specification on an open language, the, the graphics format. I can convert it into the code that can be run on kernel with a single command line. And the work that is left for the developer is, is pretty straightforward. It's just trying to connect. Okay, this is my kernel event, like a trace point or a function. It, it translates into this event on the automata or in the sequence diagram. And uh, okay, it's, it's, uh, it's not, uh, we don't have time to explain this all here, but if you look at the documentation in link it in the slide, you, you can see how easy it is. And actually, this part of the patch set that I sent to the curve. Uh, so, and how about the interface? Uh, trace users are used to the S trace interface. And here I'm showing an example of how to run that WIP monitor that I previously converted into code. So, once that monitor is loaded into the kernel, I can simply join into a, a folder the, inside the tracing. RV folder, uh, I can 
enable a reactor that is uh, a reactor is an action taken when uh, a failure in the matching the kernel and the and the model is found. So here in, in the third line, I'm saying, okay, if uh, an, an expected event in the WIP uh, monitor happens, I want you to panic the system. Boom. And in the third line, I'm enabling the monitor. And uh, as the system running, running the monitor uh, can do nothing, just watch the system, or we can even enable uh, trace points and watch yourself the, how the monitor is, is, is running, right? Until uh, hopefully not, not hitting an exception, or if we hit, we can take the, the, the right uh, action. So, okay, this is just an introduction on how do we see the runtime uh, monitor matching with the, with the hybrid approach. Uh, there is plenty of documentation. Uh, we have some documentation on the Red Hat Research Quarterly, uh, which is a magazine where we where we we showed some summary of the research research that we're doing at Red Hat. But you can also see the academic papers with all the details or on, on connecting these things uh, in these links. And uh, there is also uh, a presentation from the LC in 2019 where I explained more details all these machineries for runtime verification. And that's it. I give the word to Gabriele. Bye-bye. So thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much. So and with the runtime verification monitor, we concluded the, the integration test phase. Platform test and validation test are out of the scope uh, of uh, of this presentation and this will be covered by the standard uh, platform and uh, validation testing done uh, based on the uh, top level safety requirement allocated to the whole kernel and to the and allocated in the in the safety concepts okay so we are now at the end of the presentation and uh, let's do a bit of wrap up okay so what are the pain points here in the next steps? Okay, we talked about communication diagrams. Okay, uh, these communication diagrams, they present the static view of the interaction between drivers and subsystem. This can be supported by static analysis tools of the code. Okay, and uh, here you can see that, the, you know, we have a link to the call tree tool that uh, has been developed by uh, Mobileye, okay? And uh, you can have a look uh, in the GitHub of the Safety Architecture Working Group. This tool can be used, you know, to support the generation of these diagrams automatically, okay? A dynamic, a baseline of the, the dynamic flow diagram that can be generated by using trace points. So once we identify the interfaces between the blocks with the communication diagram, we can attach trace points to these interfaces and generate a baseline of the dynamic flow, okay? Indeed, this baseline is not comprehensive, okay? Cannot be used as a model. And what, what must be done here is to to review the baseline and uh, integrate it, you know, and uh, based uh, integrated with the with the missing uh, uh, events based uh, on the code review of the code itself. Okay. Then, as Daniel said, we need to find a way to translate these architectural diagrams into automata formal diagrams. Okay, formal model, not diagrams. Okay. And, uh, and finally, we also need uh, to comprehensively specify, you know, the behavior of the single units. So we need to write down the kernel doc headers for all the functions that today uh, are missing. Okay. And, uh, and then, so as next steps, okay, what we need to do? We need to de develop and refine tools uh, uh, to support the generation of architectural models. 
we need to continue the development of the runtime verification interface. And finally, we know we need to try to go high scale uh, by pushing these tools and engaging with the, with maintainers, you know, that should indeed be able, you know, to, to, to maintain uh, both models and uh, kernel doc headers, right? And uh, I will say that I'm done. So question and answer. So guys, please, please go ahead and uh, raise your, your question. Okay. Thank you very much for watching.